Thank you very much for in, inviting me this evening and uh, for the introduction that you've given. Um, perhaps I should say just a few words about on my own account. Um, I started the South Southwark for Europe um, group, which is a European movement group like yours, only rather smaller, I think. Um, and we were very active um, during the marches and the people's vote and all that exciting, ultimately depressing time. Um, since then, <clears throat> um, I joined, although I joined in 2015, the Make Votes Matter group, and I do think they're the most active um, lobbying group for electoral reform. And so I've put my energies, and I must say, since we actually um, left the EU into the into into the make votes matter and also into the electoral reform society um, because i fear that the european spring will take quite some time to come and the most immediate job i think is to try and ensure that we don't have a brexit government forever which actually unless we get some kind of progressive alliance and some kind of uh, electoral reform we could actually face that dire possibility. Um, so that's why my all my energies at the moment, um, while South Southwark for Europe is somewhat in hibernation, um, are for the for electoral reform. This evening, I hope to do two things. I know that you're a very well informed group, and a lot of what I say probably you know already. Um, but maybe not everybody does, and I hope to maybe clarify some issues. I want to show that our electoral system, often regarded by people as a boring technical issue, is in fact the foundation on which our whole democracy stands, and to show just how unstable that foundation is. Secondly, I want to consider how it could be reformed. Let me start with asking you a very simple question. What do you think you're doing when you go to vote in a general election? A very simple question. And I think you're probably voting for a party to lead a national government. If so, you're required to use a uniquely inappropriate voting system. And I'm not using the word uniquely loosely. No other country in Europe uses our first past the post system. Well, there's a sort of minor exception to that. Um, and that is Belarus, who uses a sort of first past the post system. But I don't think that Belarus really should be our model. And even the British government has tacitly recognised that the system is the, the, the first past post system is too crude for a modern democracy. All the developed devolved legislatures that the government has set up after the, over the last 20 or so years for Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and the London Assembly, all are elected by some form of proportional representation although few people seem to be fully aware of that. While countries in continental Europe have frequently been forced by wars and revolutions to reorder their existence, the ancient so-called mother of parliaments has dozed on, more interested in her venerable traditions than in her democratic authenticity. The problem is, that first past the post continues to assume <clears throat> a centuries old concept which long predates the existence of political parties. It assumes that elections are only about voting for an individual to represent the interests of a local area. No attention is paid to whether the 650 individual constituency elections bear any relation to the votes cast by the country as a whole. The, vote, the results can be very surprising. And I'd like to show you that on the first of my uh, slides. 
you can see that in 2019, the Conservatives had 43.6% of the votes cast, but 56% of the seats in the House of Commons. The Green Party, the Liberal Democrats, and the Brexit Party, between them, had 16% of the votes, but 2% of the seats. The Conservatives had just a 1.2% increase in their vote share, but got 48 extra seats in the House of Commons. The Liberal Democrats had a 4% increase in their vote share, but lost a seat in the House of Commons. And this isn't a new problem. In 1951, Labour won the most votes, but Conservatives got the most seats. In 1974, the Conservatives won the most votes, but Labour won the most seats. So this is a problem that has been going on for decades um, and it is a problem, in my view, needs resolving. Um, I mean, this is just a sort of final um, pie chart thing, just to show you the idiocy of our current system. And this is 2015. And on the left hand side, you can see how we actually voted and the share that, for example, the Conservatives got, um, and which is the most important thing. Although I suppose the sort of um, quarter on the top left hand side is also pretty important. Um, because if you look at how we voted and then compare with the right hand side what we got, you see that is the way that the Conservatives managed to win the 2015 election and all that followed, the referendum, everything. Um, with a, if we hadn't had that voting system in 2015, we had a proper one that reflected the votes cast, we would not now be out of Europe. And you can see that the Lib Dem and the Greens and the Brexit vote just disappeared, just slid into tiny little lines. And that's what the first past the post system does. Um, um, I think I'll leave that up just to sort of <laughs> to rub it in a bit um, and, and, and go, go, go on. Because, I mean, I hope I've shown you that our electoral system distorts and poisons the roots of our democracy. And the trouble is, what do we do about it? The key problem is how, in the interest of fairness and democracy, to make the number of seats held in parliament by each party to be in proportion to the number of votes cast for that party, i.e. proportional representation. The official position of Make Votes Matter um, <clears throat> whom I'm representing this evening, is that there are three possible solutions, all of which are acceptable. Um, uh, uh, the party list system, one. Two, the mixed member system, usually known as in the UK, as the AMS additional member system, but in the rest of the world known as the mixed member system. And thirdly, the single transferable vote known as STV. They make folks matter, don't choose to favour any particular system because they feel that they should be open to anything that um, may be offered um, because any of them would be much better than the first past the post. Um, I think this is inclined to leave a lot of confusion in the public mind. They hear there's this and there's that and the other scheme and they think, oh my God, I can't be bothered to deal with all of that. Uh, let's stick with what we've got. So I think there should be a clear preference made. Um, and like the Electoral Reform Society, I think STV is the best system. And I will try to below to explain how and why. But first of all, let's look at the party list system. This requires each party to draw up a list of candidates in order of perceived merit. The number of votes cast for each party determines how many from that list will be elected. Many people assume that this is the only possible form of PR and they say, oh no, it's, we don't like that. We want to have constituencies represented. Um, <clears throat> but actually there are other methods as we'll come to in a minute. It is certainly though the party list system, the most, the most exactly proportional, but it's not acceptable to most people in the UK because as I say, it gives too much control to political parties rather than making MPs accountable to the constituencies who have voted for them, 
Although I should say that the party list system is used uh, by 31 out of 43 countries in Europe. Um, <clears throat> Then there's the additional member system, uh, which is AMS, as it's known in the UK, which attempts to have the best of both worlds. Voters have two ballot papers. The first paper is to choose a representative for their constituency on a simple first-past-the-post basis. The second pa uh, paper requires the voter to choose a party, and this determines the required proportion of members for each party in the parliament or the assembly. This is achieved by adding the right number from the party list to add to those already elected in constituencies. The London Assembly, for example, a, a, a fairly close to home example, has 14 constituency members, 56%, and 11 party list members, 44%. And that's a fairly typical ratio for the additional member system. Although this is fairer to smaller parties, it still has significant disadvantages. First of all, having two classes of representatives causes tensions over different members' accountability, whether to the constituents or to the party. <clears throat> Secondly, it doesn't solve the problem of safe seats and, and particularly wo wo uh, wasted votes. Thirdly, the parties, certainly in my view, have overdue influence and then altogether, it seems more of a sort of hybrid fix than a complete, well-worked-out system. Then there is the third one, the single transferable vote, the STV. Instead of one person representing everyone in a small area, a number of MPs, typically four or five, are elected for a much larger area. Voters number on a list of candidates, candidates of any party or none, number one for their first choice, number two for their, th their second, etc. As many or as few as they like. To be elected, a candidate needs a set number of votes uh, called the quota, which if you're interested is the number of votes cast divided by a number of the number of seats available plus one. Surplus votes are redistributed to second choices, as are those for anyone eliminated because they have too few votes. And I just wanted to show you a slide. Now we <laughs> seem to have got them up, okay. Um, that uh, the figures for the 2019 election and how it might have worked out. One can't be sure because there are so many sort of different ways in which people might vote with a different system, but roughly how the 2019 election results might have worked out had it been done under STV. Well, that, um, is, can, can you see them? Yes, yes. that's visible to me, certainly. Yes. Um, so the, um, the, vote, the third column shows the vote share for each of the parties on the left. Uh, and in the second column, the, the total votes. Um, and you can see that in the fourth column, the black column, you can see the number of MPs that were elected under first past the post. Had it been done under STV or probably um, something similar under any kind of form of rep proportional representation, the column on the right shows the number of seats that each of those parties would have gained. Um, I mean, you can see for yourselves, I don't need to read them out to you. I suppose some of the most uh, dramatic results are the Greens would have got 17 um, MPs rather than one. Um, and um, <clears throat> Brexit ones would have got 13 rather than naught, and the Lib Dems would have got 76 rather than, rather than 11. However, perhaps the most interesting thing is that if you look at the total that Labour would have got, 210, plus the Lib Dems, 76, that comes to 286 and is two more seats than the Conservatives. I mean, what a different result that would be. Where would we would be in such a different place now had that been the result of the 2019 um, uh, election? I mean, it's, it's, it's quite sort of takes your mind. It is really quite difficult to contemplate just how different the world would be 
had it had we had a decent electoral system in 2019 and well 2017 too and particularly and also 2015 particularly um so um i mean nobody could be quite sure but that's roughly how it would have worked out um and so very different from what we got um <clears throat> there are other advantages to stv i think First of all, representatives are chosen by the people they resent, represent, not the party, which is how other proportional systems more or less work, although the, the additional member system has, is, a, is a sort of hybrid. Voters, too, voters can choose to vote for candidates from more than one party. Um, there are almost no wasted votes because surplus votes are transferred to second choice candidates. Tactical voting is not necessary because the unsuccessful votes, second choices are also transferred. The mixed opinions within the constituency are reflected as accurately as possible. And any voter usually has at least one MP sympathetic to his or her views. And I thought um, as a sort of little gesture to the fact that I'm in Northeast Surrey at the moment, um, I thought I might do a, a little rough uh, working out of how the 2019 election would have voted, would have resulted in this area. I would guess that probably um, these five um, constituencies, um, Mole Valley, East Surrey, Rygate, Epsom and Ewell, and Isher and Walton might well have made, might, might well make one uh, STV constituency returning five members to the Commons. And first of all, on the first ones up now, you can see that um, what actually happened and all those figures and people will be familiar to you. Um, as you all know, um, five Conservatives were returned. A mixed ability. Um, and um, this is what would have happened, or roughly what would have happened had it been under STV with a five member constituency, the, with a single transferable vote. Um, the quota would have been, I'll just bring that down, there we are. Uh, the quota would have been the total number of votes cast there, um, divided by six, five, five um, seats plus one, and would have, reserved, would have been 48,000. It's quite clear that 48,000 will go three times into 158,000. And so the Conservatives would clearly have three um, members. The, it's also quite clear that 48 will go easily into 83. So the Lib Dems would also have had um, one uh, MP. Then, then the area becomes a little more obscure because um, you have to get into the realm of counting the votes, the second class, second um, choice votes of the Conservatives, um, and you also the second choice votes of the Greens and the other minority parties. I would guess, but one can't be sure because obviously not there to count, um, that probably that would have resulted in a second Liberal Democrat um, member, but it could have resulted um, in, in a Labour member. But it would still have been three plus one plus one or three plus two, um, which would have been rather different from five. And you would see that all these people here, those four parties there, or that's I don't know, those are a mixture of things, um, would have had at least somebody a bit closer to, to um, their views and what they wanted. Um, as I say, you can't be absolutely sure because particularly with STV, you're voting for people and individuals you, know, you don't have just parties and you have no choice you could look for example at the various conservatives that might have stood and you might well find that some you thought were more acceptable than others and you could even have voted for two conservatives three conservatives and two other members if you you had would have had that freedom to do so um so i mean that's how i think roughly stv would have worked in, in northeast Surrey. After all this, you might well say, well, why on earth do we still have first past the post? Um, 
Um, the answer is extremely simple, as I think probably all of you will uh, immediately know. Only a parliament can change the system, but up to now, the current system has suited the two main parties very well, and Turkeys, as we all know, don't vote for Christmas. However, that sort of is at the end of my story, but not quite, because there is a footnote to all this. The Labour Party is beginning to wonder if first past the post still suits them so well, and the imminent Labour Party conference may prove very interesting. That's basically, um, we're very happy to take any questions or any criticisms um, that anyone may wish to raise. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Having looked at your analysis of the 2019 election, which showed Labour and Lib Dems would have exceeded Conservatives, it's hardly surprising that the Conservatives don't like that. And in fact, we have been hearing today that mm. there's stuff in the Telegraph saying that they're going to um, consolidate first past the post. Mm. So it, this is very reminiscent of Brexit. Um, people are going to look at what suits their preferences and ignore the rest. So <clears throat> I, I, I notice they're already doing slogans saying, make your MP accountable. You can get rid of him with first past the post. All those slogans apply to PR as well, don't they? Mm -hmm. So we've really got, I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I'm supposed to be asking you your opinion and I am. We've got to figure out how to sell this to the public, surely. I mean, can you amplify that? Yes, I mean, I, I think, that is, it, it, there's two different things I think we need to do, um, very different, e probably equally important. One, as you say, to make the public more aware of all the shortcomings of a voting system, which they're perfectly uh, used to, content with, they don't question it, unfortunately. Um, the, the Make Votes Matter is inclined, intending to have street stalls um, in the autumn, and I've been putting together a kind of, um, a uh, quiz which which asks questions with surprising answers and if anybody on the street can uh, actually get it all right they can do it on on mobile phones um they can get a chocolate bar um but it or something like that i mean the idea would be that ordinary people just going about shopping on a saturday morning um would have be be in, uh, encouraged to to uh, take part in something which made them much more aware. Uh, most people like quizzes and most people like small prizes. Um, that's the sort of, I mean, and, and, and Make Votes Matters trying to find all sorts of ways in which um, the public might become um, more educated about the shortcomings of their system. The other really crucial thing, which, um, uh, which I hinted at in the footnote, is what Make Votes Matters be really trying to concentrate on. And that is to get the Labour Party to see that they will never, it's very likely that in the foreseeable future, they will never, ever win an, uh, an outright majority. They will never form a government by themselves um, under first past the post system. Um, and only with great difficulty if they recognise that they will need to uh, look at some kind of progressive alliance, some kind of working together um, with all the people that don't like the present government, um, because obviously they're the biggest opposition party. Uh, and that's why, I, I mean, it will be very interesting to see what happens at the Labour Party conference, because now over 300 local Labour groups have put forward a motion in favour of electoral reform. Um, but the problem is that the powers that be don't seem to, and the unions don't seem to realise that they, they aren't going to win, they aren't going to be a government. They just aren't, not since they lost all this, practically all the seats in Scotland. Never mind the red wall, it doesn't matter, you could get all those back and they still wouldn't win. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to have really penetrated uh, the Labour mind. And, and until it does, I personally, you know, it, we can inform the, try to inform the general public, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't see how we can actually do anything unless um, we, all those parties that oppose the 
actions of this corrupt and and uh, authoritarian government um, work together. And that is the only hope, in my view. And I think it's the most crucial thing that any of us should be working for at the moment. Uh, I mean, thank you for thank you for that. We've we've got to hope that the Labour Party changes. That's obviously important. Um, can I just ask my colleague Monica if she's um, ready to read out any questions or what? Um, are you there, Monica? Um, yes, I am. Hello. Um, yes, I am. I'm, uh, what I would like to do, we haven't had a huge number of questions. So I think we are in a position where I could actually get the people who pose the questions to ask the question, which I think is, is, is quite a good thing to do. Right. Mm. Um, but I, the first question was asked was actually by myself. So I'm going to kick off and ask um, the question. Oh, hang on, just get it up. Can I also say keep an eye on who has raised their hands? Oh, okay. Yes, no, we'll do. Yes, yeah. Um, I will ask the question, will PR persuade young people to vote? I mean, by young people, I mean under 30. I don't know is obviously the, the very simple answer. Um, it, it will do more, I think. Um, I mean, it, it, will, it might entice them to vote a little bit more than the current system. But the problem is getting it over to them because um, uh, you know, it's very hard to actually get through to young people. And people say, okay, we'll get six talks to six forms, etc. But under the present circumstances with COVID and everything being under such pressure, I don't think many, many heads have got much sort of time for, for those kind of things. They're concentrating on keeping going. Um, so um, but if you said to them, well, look, this is an old, this is the old system was like this and the new system is like that, I'm quite sure that they would, that would be helpful. But how we get really through to them, I, I, I don't know is the answer. I think in many ways it would be easier if we did have a vote at 16. I mean, I'm, I'm not particularly in favour of it, but I think it would be much easier in schools. Um, actually to be talking for quite some time about elections in a steady sort of way um, to younger people. Um, whereas I think that often 17 and 18 year olds, <laughs> and I speak of the next head, often think they know the lot anyway, um, and may be less susceptible for arguments being put to them. Yeah. I mean, I quite agree, that's where we need it. Um, and so many of them are pretty aghast by Brexit. And if you say, well, Brexit would never have happened had we got a proper, if we'd had a proper electoral system, it simply wouldn't. Um, I mean, that might, might sort of persuade them that they need to take this seriously. Yes, yes, that, thank you. Um, right, now, uh, what I'm going to try is to, uh, I'm going to ask uh, David Gulland, who asked a couple of questions to speak, if that's all right, I will unmute him. Oh, hang on. Uh, invite. Yep, I'm on you. Too. <laughs> oh, right. Thank you, yep. David. Thank yep. you. Hi. Thanks, Monica. Um, I guess it's sort of two pronged. Linking back to your point about the young people and slogans, really, it's trying to get people motivated. And a lot of people don't vote because it, they say it doesn't matter. It won't make a difference, etc. Both in terms of safe seats where the Tories don't bother voting because they've already got the MP, or whether they're Greens or Lib Dems or whoever in a, in a difficult um, uh, place. So I think we do need to move, we all recognise the importance of proportionality and recognise the importance of, I think, the um, legislature reflecting the variety of views in the voting, you know, in the voting population. Um, I guess the question is, what do you call it? And unfortunately, we're in this stupid world of slogans. <laughs> um, mm. There's been a bit of a chat about this. So it is depressing, but we do need a slogan. And I know your movement, Bridget, you know, make, make those matter is, is quite a good one. But I think we need to move even better than that and try to find a way to get the young people to understand that every vote matters or whatever it is to mm. say that everyone needs to take part in this because. However we do it, whether STV or 
my little other idea about you know um, uh, single consistencies but with top ups um, similar to Germany but a bit different. Um, you can make a difference. So have you thought about how to cut through the apathy and the marketing of of PR to get it to resonate to people who might not be that interested in the philosophy and the um, underlying fairness of having a, a proper <laughs> democratic system? Um, I think um myself um i don't i'm not so i don't know that i'm speaking particularly for make votes matter um that what we have to do is to sort of work um on the just the general public so to speak um in a in a drip by drip um way which we won't see much results but slowly possibly it does penetrate and i think for the young people and the people that don't vote normally I think that has to be done much closer to any election because the vast majority of people, quite honestly, don't think about voting, don't think about um, anything to do with elections until pretty close to the time, certainly not before an election is announced. Then I think you're absolutely right on social media, somehow or other, I'm, I'm afraid somehow or other is the most pathetic way of saying anything because it doesn't mean anything, but I don't know uh, is all I could say at the moment quite how, but I reckon with young people it probably has to be on social media um, and, um, and a very hard, sharp campaign because most of the things that bubble up on social media bubble down again very quickly, so the timing is crucial. And I, I think it has to be pretty close to an election. But then you've got the problem of what the present government is trying to do in making it very difficult for people that don't have a sort of solid um, uh, static um, existence um, to actually vote. I mean, it's, it's not going to be very easy for them to vote. If they've got to produce a, um, a, an ID and all the rest of it, a photo ID. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and the government is on purpose putting all these hurdles uh, um, in front of them, so I mean that I think it's it's collecting money, it's doing a drip by drip uh, uh, education process for the the general public, and then having a really uh, intense campaign with money money raised um, in the weeks before the election. But I mean, since the government is quite clearly doing everything it can. Uh, to remain in power forever, <laughs> it's it's going to be a very tough job. So thank thank you, Bridget. But now um, I would like to call Anna Barrier to pose her question. I'm going to invite her to Anna. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, hello, Anna. Yay! Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm looking at what was my first question. I think I asked a couple. I, I can um, remind you if you like. Would you like to remind you? Oh, yeah. It's the Johnson's government, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Johnson's government is hell-bent. Hell-bent, yeah. yeah. On it's reducing bent. the number of elections in UK that do not use first past the post. And I'm talking about the police and crime commissioner uh, election and the, reg the regional mayors. So Make Votes Matter has a petition about this, and I'm sure most of us have really signed it, but what else could we do to call out the government's blatant attempt to reduce our democratic choice even further? What else can we do? I don't know if that can be effective. I mean, we all went on the people's marches and millions of people said what they thought and it had absolutely no effect. Um, uh, I, quite frankly, um, I mean, I understand the question, but I don't know the answer. If you, if you if, sorry to turn it back to you, which is a bit mean, but I was wondered if, if you had any proposals, if anybody had any proposals as to, as to what we could do. Um, I have an idea. This was, my, 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 my son is a sort of political campaigner and he said billboards hmm. sort of come up with some graphics and, stick it on billboards it's apparently not that expensive you know and led by donkeys did it i was just going to um, say led by donkeys led yeah. by donkeys might might take it up um, um well i i think you know just contact the people who own the billboards and and put 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 them up um 
mm. I feel mm. tempted to to give it a go myself. Um, yes, my my daughter's got. I mean, it's not it's particularly on this, but on all the all the wrong things that the government is doing. She's got on her front window um, a whole. Um, uh, sort of criticism of all the things that her how democracy is, is threatened and it she happens to have a window very close to the road so you can read it easily from the pavement um, and it's beginning to cause quite a lot of um, interest so I mean it's a bit similar to having her own window billboard um, and yes I guess that's probably something that we could do and led by donkeys would certainly probably I mean if they could have some very good designs maybe we could um, you know individuals could put them up in places where they're not supposed to but would wear attract attention um, um now questions um patrick reynolds uh i'm going to just see if i can find patrick and invite him to speak who is there i'm uh, unmuted now you found that's fine hello patrick I, the trouble is i'm easy to find because i'm sitting in the top row like like i think we all are aren't we um, no, you're sitting like three rows be below me, Patrick. But not on my, <laughs> not on my screen. You're below me. It's all different. Each person. Um, look, my my question is about Progressive Alliance. Bridget, you mentioned Progressive Alliance quite early on, um, and you've not said said very much about it. Uh, <clears throat> we had the county council elections this year, and I did some work with the results from the KCC Kent County Council elections. And it's very clear that if we had some form of alliance between uh, Labour Liberals and Greens, and occasionally uh, some independents in certain seats, we could change it from a county council where of the 81 seats, 62%, 76 and a half, sorry, 62 of the seats, 76 and a half percent are Tory, to a council where 31 of them are Tory. Now that, uh, that assumes, there's a very big assumption there, and that's that everybody votes exactly like they did last time, and that's probably not a valid assumption, but I think it might work both ways. Now, I think the advantage of that is, is that if you can do it at a local level by working together, you can show people, this is, takes time, I know it takes many years, show people that their votes can matter. Mm. If you show people that their votes can matter, then you can engage them a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, I think there's a, a lot of potential mileage in progressive alliances, but I think that some heads need knocking together, because I understand that it's Labour Party policy that they must stand in every seat. I believe that the Lib Dems have something similar. Um, it ain't going to work that way. We've got to work together. Yes, but it was quite clever, I thought, that in the um, um, uh, what Spens election in Yorkshire, um, that's not quite the right name. Batley anyway, and Spens. What? Batley and Spens. Yes. Um, that actually um, the Lib Dems didn't stand down, um, but they only get campaigned in the, in the areas where Labour was very weak. Um, and they were the people that actually might get people to vote not conservative. Um, and so in that way, they were very useful. They did something for Labour without, but was being, but it was quite good for themselves. And the people it was bad for were the conservatives. So I think, I think it has to be very subtle, any kind of progressive alliance, and it has to be done constituency by constituency. Absolutely. And I think it has to start now. Um, yes. because you can't build up this kind of trust and working together and working out how it could work in your particular area and every area is different um, unless you start early enough. I agree, I agree entirely with what you've just said Bridget, it's absolutely right, but it does, I mean, it does need to be dealt with at local level and we do have to start now and how many people are actually doing something about it? Well, I mean, the thing is, my constituency has a very large Labour majority. The MP is fully in favour of electoral reform. She's very enlightened, um, kind of the best of the Labour, as it were. And, um, and um, you know, I, 
I don't need to, there's nothing much to do there, but it's not so easy to sort of thrust yourself into other people's areas where you don't live. But I mean, I quite agree. I mean, how many of us is, how many of us are doing whatever it is that we- I, I was I was thinking more like a, a higher level where, where the, the parties that are not in power to be saying, we go out and go out and, and not prepare to govern, go out and prepare to talk to other people and, and, and come to arrangements, working arrangements. It doesn't have to be formal mm -hmm. coalition or anything, but do anything. The first objective is to get this terrible government out. Exactly. And then decide how to play it. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Um, I'd like to ask, I'm going to invite John Bassendine, who has a, a, a um, interesting question about universities. So, John, are you there? Yes, I am there now. I hello, hello, yes, thank you. Um, yes, I, I um, don't know a great deal about universities, I must say, and I don't know how the various posts in the National Union of Students or the particular union organizations in each university are elected um can anybody enlighten us about the the processes at, at the universities i i think um um yeah, our coordinator probably knows something about that uh, i think she had some involvement with universities I don't. I don't know. I'm afraid. I think that each university is very different, and each sort of subject, you know, each, each group of students is very different. Um, so to have any kind of general policy, I think, would be quite difficult. And I don't know about the National Union students. They, in the past, always seem to be more fighting for their own rights and, you know, grants and and um, things to make their own universities better rather than the, the big um, picture. But I mean, that, that's only a very, very rough and, and, and ready sort of response. Mm. Does make votes matter? Have contacts with uh, universities do they have branches in various universities um no there are local branches lots of them but i don't think they do have them in universities and it's certainly something that it's an interesting idea we could try putting it forward um and um yep i could easily take that back and, and see what you know what 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 possibilities that would would raise um I mean, in our local Make Votes Matter group in Southwark, we do have, um, I mean, there's, there are like people in their 20s, quite a lot of them are quite young, um, which is good, but I'm not quite sure how very much they can influence their contemporaries. Mm. I noticed that Richard Jones has his hand up and maybe... Yes, no, I, I, I just was just going to invite Richard to speak. Um, so here we go, Richard. Would you like to take the floor? Thank you very much. I, I wanted to come back to, to Bridget's question about or point about needing to encourage, and Patrick was saying the same thing, needing, needing to encourage um, uh, local parties to think about some kind of progressive alliance, how um, um, well before the election, and how Bridget was saying that needs to be done constituency by constituency. And my question is about uh, the number, really. And, and engagement of Make Votes Matter local groups, because I think they could be very well placed to get engaged in encouraging local parties to see the value of proportional representation or whatever we want to put it. But I don't know how many Make Votes Matter local groups there are around the country. In Herefordshire, um, we had a group that was led by one person who's so busy she's decided to, to give up and she couldn't do very much during the during lockdown restrictions anyway. But we have got several members of Herefordshire for Europe, which I chair, who are very interested in proportional representation as well. And one of them has volunteered to talk to the predecessor to see whether we could take that job on as a, as a separate, separate from the European movement stuff, but because of our interest in pushing um, proportional representation locally, where we have two Conservative MPs with very strong majorities, but if we could 
through Make Votes Matter perhaps, work with um, the local parties to see how we could build up some opposition to those two Conservative MPs. But, mm -hmm. but is Make Votes Matter represented in decent strength all over the country to be able to do follow that, that, that strategy? I think it's very patchy, um, probably. Um, I mean, they ha there is a map on the website which shows <clears throat> all the local groups. It's not always completely up to date, but um, it attempts to be. Um, <clears throat> and I think the, there are problems with, probably it's quite difficult to get into um, uh, we, well, the concentration has been very much with Labour, um, because not on the not on the, at the moment on the question of progressive alliance between the parties, but much more trying to work where the members of the um, uh, vote, make votes matter are Labour themselves to work with local parties to get them to put motions for the. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Labour Party conference, because unless the Labour Party changes its policy, um, basically the whole thing's doomed, because we've got to have Labour on board, I think, at, at the top, um, in order for local constituencies to work together. They've got to be, have the approval of the um, top people in the Labour Party. And that, I think, can only come about by motions put forward by a big majority in the, in the conference. So there are sort of a lot of different um, streams here, I think, working. I mean, the, the, make those better. That has been their priority, um, hoping that they could get proportional representation as being uh, likely to be in the Labour manif manifesto and accepted as Labour policy, because that is possibly the most important thing to do. If that happens, then I think the next thing would be to work, um, to try and work with in local parties, local members that we of parties that we know to be um, quite influential in their own party and to work towards working together. But I mean, the, the situation is so different in, in in different parts of the country, which are what the majorities are, whether they're conservative or, 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 or whether they're not. It's, it's not easy to have a blanket policy. But up to now, it has been to get the Labour Party to, to, to change their, their ideas about proportional representation. Um, where we go in the future, I don't know. Is it, it's? It, I think is it is trying to influence people that are mem members of uh, Make Votes Matter and members of political parties to to work within their parties to work with other parties. Yes, but I mean, if we don't begin now, it's it's you know it's not a quick. <laughs> Absolutely, no. Thank you for that. May, may I just make a quick comment on Patrick Reynolds' uh, comment about getting into six forms, because a year ago I accompanied the then uh, Herefordshire MVM representative to Hereford Sixth Form College to promote Make Votes Matter and just to engage with students and say, you know, of course they were 16 and they didn't have a vote. Would you like to have a vote? When you, when you vote, would you like to make your vote get somewhere? But um, this, this year, when we're not doing that because we haven't got a Make Votes Matter um, a person, but I went to Sixth Form College last year, last week to promote uh, the European movement and again to Hereford College of Arts next week to promote young European movement and the Erasmus Plus Alliance and so on. Freshers' fairs are a way in uh, on to, 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 to get to young people. What response did you get from the six formers? Quite a bit of interest, particularly from uh, second year politics students who also came to the Freshers' Fair and I got a list of about 13, 14 people signed up. So we've some of them just walked by, they weren't interested, but some mm. were ready to engage. Because mm. do you, do you, do you, are you interested in European issues? And, 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 and a year ago, more relevantly to MVM, about half of them uh, do, you know, walked by without any interest and the other half showed some uh, knowledge and interest in, mm. in voting issues. Mm. Um, surely some of those young people would say, my vote won't make the slightest difference at the moment. If you couldn't say back to them, well, let's get PR, whatever we're going to call it, some more attractive name, perhaps. If we can say back to them, but your vote, small though it may be, will make a difference ever so slightly. That's quite a useful, better argument, is it not? And what about what about make your vote matter? I'm not suggesting 
make votes matter change its name, but that could be something to be used as a slogan occasionally. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, they would say, well, you make it matter, we can't. I mean, I want my moat to matter, but um, yeah, I can't make it matter, so to speak, unless, unless changes come um, me. You know, it, it is very tricky. But I think one, one point, I mean, I, I had a discussion yesterday with my 22-year-old daughter, and she said, well, my vote doesn't count. I said, look, if you all voted, mm -hmm. then that you know that the the political parties would start to listen it doesn't almost doesn't matter who you vote for um but just the fact that you are voting will make a difference um, anyway uh sorry i'm 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 i need to get back to my job here lillian and tony mccobb would you like to um i will just unmute you um, Hello, hello, Tony. Yeah, we are on the participants list, but it's probably Tony rather than Lillian. Um, uh, right, okay, sorry, Tony. Uh, our main concern is simply the time available to produce any electoral change whatsoever. Um, the electoral bill that's going through at the moment proposes basically to abandon PR. It proposes to uh, stop charities making any political statements. It proposes to almost criminalize any liaison between the various opposition parties. And from our point of view, the, the main points uh, we would like to make is that it's very important to have some kind of mo uh, mobilization of voters or voting campaigns as early as possible because Let's face it, um, at the moment, it looks like Johnson is going to call an election in round about autumn 2030, uh, 2023, when the boundary changes will have taken place. Uh, but it, he can also call a, an election at any time before that if he wants to, and if he sees that the situation is favourable. Thank you. Bridget, do you have a response to, to it? There? Well, I mean, not really, because that, that bill hasn't passed yet, has it, changing the voting? It's um, going to, it's going to. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, well, what can what could stop anything now, basically? That's the trouble. Um, yeah, not, I mean, I don't, I don't really think so. I mean, I, I just think that, that, I mean, we have to start now, is, is whatever. I mean, I think that's just it's, it's as simple as that. Well, whatever is happening, um, it, whatever, it, it, what we have to do is not going to be quick and we need to start as soon as possible. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not unlike the 30s, is it? In Germany, actually. Hmm. Uh, I, I understand and agree with the pessimism but I, up to now, I think the government's quite popular because it's seen as having done a good job with the virus. I think that's questionable, but it's managed to sell that to a lot of ordinary middle of the road people. I cannot see how it's going to continue to do well when the virus is less significant and the effects of Brexit are more significant. I think they're good at words. I'm not sure they're very good at uh, running the country. So when they become less popular, we might be more easily heard. Uh, so, you know, I'm clutching at straws here, but um, it's good to be optimistic. Yes, indeed. And also when, um, you know, universal credit is, is reduced and, and a lot of things become much more difficult than they have been. I mean, that won't be very helpful to the government either. But the trouble is they've still got that majority in Parliament. Yeah. But, um... yeah, again, um, <laughs> sorry to sound pessimistic, but if you look at the 80% of our media, uh, which are Tory controlled mm. and are peddling day by day, if you read the express headlines day by day, you will become aware that most of their readers and the Telegraph readers and the rest of them are living in cloud cuckoo land where 
the impact of Brexit uh, and the impact of COVID uh, is being uh, well, misrepresented day after day after day. Um, so even if um, people begin to get disillusioned with COVID, the media, including the BBC, will mitigate the bad impact that that's having on people. And we do have to start straight away. Um, yes, Martin Bond, I think, would like to, to have a word. Um, if he would like to unmute himself, then we will be glad to have him on the floor. So, Martin, are you there? Yes. Hello, Martin. Thanks very much. That's very kind of you. Thanks. I, I, I was very interested to see um, um, the dawning historical view coming out that it is more and more like the 30s the more you look around you um, and the time is very very short in which we can solve this problem uh, maybe it's autumn 23 i mean he had a previous opportunity when he could have basically shut down all opposition and he nearly did but didn't quite um, the party is his party is strongly behind the prime minister in the moves that he's making all those moves advantage his party more and more the only thing that can upset him is what amounts to a united or common front that front requires three parties to make sacrifices very quickly it needs someone to chair it maybe that make votes matter has a job behind the scenes getting party leaders together quietly where we don't look at them no one else looks at them but someone in make votes matter does and they quietly talk about which seats each of them will not contest and they will all campaign in favor of the best place to, to stop the conservatives winning another majority if that is not done the whole thing will be confirmed for another five years at least and this process will not stop it will go on he has already said that he wants to reign for as long as margaret thatcher that's only the beginning don't worry that's only the beginning the party will reign for longer and longer and longer than that and if you want alternate party government in our country if you want democracy as we understand it by a change of choice of government that's basic and pretty crude the alternative has to be coherent quickly and the first step is the Labour Party conference I agree these these a change at the top of the Labour Party con uh, conference uh, uh, resolutions is vital that's the first step if it doesn't come about who's who's looking for emigration you know, um, maybe Scotland might be independent one day might be a safe haven but some of the other places in the country won't be um, it, it really is very serious and really if you don't know where we came from you don't know where you're going that uh, was what i had to talk about some weeks ago um and right now i see it getting more and more slippery this slope sorry to be despondent and well not quite despondent really it could be saved but it's getting on to be close for a miracle to save it thanks uh bridget before thank, thank you, you cheer us up do, do you know sorry. what uh, do you know what keir starmer thinks about this well, as I understand it, I mean, he's been such a disappointment, hasn't he? Well, he has to me anyway. Um, and um, he, he doesn't seem to like new ideas. And the thought of Labour sort of um, having to work with other people seems to be as much an anathema to him, as far as one can tell, as it is to many of the people in the unions. So I... I, I, I I know that he hasn't shown any great enthusiasm. Um, whether he'll be pushed into it at the Labour Party conference, perhaps. But um, I mean, so far we, well, it, my opinion is that we don't know at all whether he believes in anything much. I mean, he's so cautious and he's seems to have no fire in his belly. So I, 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 uh, I don't know. But on the other hand, if he thinks that it's an important thing to win the next election, which seems to be... He can't, he can't, he can't. He um, can't. Then he, perhaps he will, because it seems to be the only thing he cares about. He doesn't seem to worry what you're fighting for to win the election. All you need to do is to win it. And possibly, if he thought that this was the way to win it, he, he, he might come on board. I don't know. Can, can, can I make a brief comment? No one will win the next election unless it's a united front 
it won't be Labour that will win the election. It won't be the Lib Dems. It won't be even the Scots Nats if they join in. It, it won't be the Greens. Um, it will only be the principle of changing the system. And that's the only thing that will bring them together. Their policies are miles apart. So there's no question of common policy except to change the system so that there will always be a chance in future of winning, not yes. letting the Conservatives And then win. they can actually... That, that's the only common ground. Yes. Sorry. But, um, you know, but, but I don't... Keir Starmer doesn't seem to be sort of big enough to grasp any, 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 of, any of this. I... Oh, he, he, dare I say, he, he is he's an amply intelligent enough man to do so. Whether he can politically, tactically within his party, I, honestly, I don't know. And, and this party conference is fairly clearly the last chance for that to show if he gets enough support or enough support comes out for him to be able to move to that position. But I, I really don't know the details of how I many think he, votes he needs. My impression from the talk that most Make Votes Matter have had it isn't a question of him saying, yes, this is a good idea, but I can only do it if I get the support of the, at the Labour Party conference. It's more, oh, I don't know that this is a very good idea. We, we you know, Labour have always been in control. We don't want to be messing around with working with other parties. It, he doesn't seem to be dying to get support for it, unfortunately. Um, well, well, that's a very unrealistic view of what the arithmetic tells him about his party's absolutely. prospects within yeah. the next year or two. <laughs> absolutely, but he doesn't seem to, and quite a lot of Labour, uh, quite prominent Labour people, don't seem to get it. I, I, mm. I, it's quite surprising. And I'm not sure myself that, uh, I mean, I think that, that working together with the parties has got to be very subtle. I don't think you can just say, um, you know, because of some of the seats where the Conservatives need to need to come over to vote, um, uh, to leave the Conservative Party, they mm -hmm. won't do it to Labour. They might do it to the Liberal Democrats. But if they think that the Liberal Democrats and the Labour are sort of almost merged um, for this ele for an election, they won't do it. So it's it's not, you know, it's all very subtle and mm. every single constituency, I think, has a different balance. Sure, sure, sure. Sure. I quite agree that, that up and down the country it's very different. If you are in the southwest, it looks very different from London or from the northeast or Manchester. Mm -hmm. But each of these areas, each of the constituencies, way, sometimes yeah. groups, have mm -hmm. to decide how to make the common front. But if they don't make a common front, it will never happen. It's simple as that. It will never happen. It's it one is. of those... It's a watershed in history, and we're very close to it. And to go back to electoral reform, you know, <laughs> if we had had a decent system, we wouldn't have had the results. Yes, 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 yes. you know, I know only. you can't go back. It's only. It just makes it we realise how important the thing is um, that when we see the disasters that have come because we have got such a lousy system. Yes, but the choice of system cannot precede the alliance. No, the alliance no, no, will no, have to be on not, the principle of no. reform. Yes, and that's it, all. We, it, we will never ever do it until we can no. get until the, the, uh, 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 an alliance opposed to the Tories is no. majority no. in the no. government. That's no. the that, I agree. Thank you. <laughs> it's very, Sorry, it, it all sounds um, a bit despondent, but um, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, dramatic. Uh, yeah. it's dramatic. It's dramatic. <laughs> and, it, and so many people just do not seem to realise where this government is taking us. I mean, we've never we've never had our freedoms and our and and, and our democratic principles and our in just just principles in general uh, attacked like this. I, mean, I I'm eighty and I've never seen anything like this before in my life. Um, thanks. Thank you, thanks for everybody. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question if anyone wants to ask one. Otherwise, we may be wrapping up. Um, any more questions? I'd like to contribute something but towards the end, but I see Lillian and Tony McCobb would like to say something again. Oh, right. Uh, uh, Tony, I'll, I'll come in later. Yeah, all, all I would say is simply that um, the, the COVID pandemic has been a real blessing for the Conservative Party because it's been able to gloss over its own failings and also the failings of Brexit uh, and also its own uh, undemocratic nature. How we deal with 
incredibly important, but I think probably the most important thing is to find some kind of alliance or agreement uh, to, to get rid of the present uh, electoral system and introduce a new one. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. That, that, that's a, a good place to finish. Evelyn, would you please, uh, um, would you like to have your say? Well, I am most inspired by what Martin was saying. I think I'll have to listen to the recording again because you are absolutely spot on. Thank you. And also what Bridget was uh, responding with. Um, I think we are sleepwalking into autocracy. And uh, I mean, it's easy to over dramatize, but my grandfather spoke up against a certain German leader in Germany. He was German in the 1930s and then he was demoted in his job and then when it came to the um, being conscripted he was sent to the Russian front and he became a Russian prisoner of war but he did survive just but um, it was pretty awful so to, uh, we're going to have to it it may not be as bad as uh, 1930s Europe but we have to make sure that all the MPs and the people who are in power are held to account and that's something that's so important and I think all of us here really feel the same. And I want to do all I can to, even if it's just scraping a mountain with a teaspoon, at least do something or the drip drip effect or whatever. And I would like to ask Bridget how we can do this um, street stalls on the um, with your app or whatever it is on the mobile phones with the piece of chocolate as a, <laughs> a piece. <laughs> response but I'd also like to talk with Martin more at some stage or maybe we can email each other but what more we can do to raise awareness of this. Mm. I, I've just come back from a holiday in Cornwall and everyone of course they were on holiday but the, um, they did not want to talk about politics at all and I'm considered a bit of an, a fanatic if I ever raise the subject so I have to keep my mouth shut but I did manage to say to the other people at the bed and breakfast, we all have to get our information from a variety of sources, not just from one, so that we get the full picture and not just one uh, skewed view, but to try and get it across and get people to wake up. Mm -hmm. Gina Miller said, wake up people in one of her texts or tweets or something. And we, we need to get this, we've had our summer holiday now, we've got COVID, we've got to face up to whatever's coming this winter, but I really think we do need to, get people as involved as possible and going into the schools uh, I'm going to contact Richard again about how we do that and colleges to wake people up to being aware if you don't vote then you get who you didn't vote for um, I'm sure there's another better phrase than that but we do need to get people involved more we don't want to do what happened in the 1930s to allow the extremists to take control. And then suddenly we wake up one morning, we find we've, we have no say at all. And that is a frightening prospect. It may not be as bad as that, but it's certainly looking that way. And we've got to do all we can to uh, prevent it. And as Martin said, this Labour Party conference is maybe our last chance. Anyway, I'm, with, I'm wittering on. Thank you for listening. Um, other people have got better things to say than me, but thank you for listening anyway. <laughs> Uh, to pick up on what Evelyn's saying, I particularly focus on this step-by-step -step situation. Each step is very small and trivial seeming, but they add up to a journey and we, we need to be careful about that. We need to learn from history. It's pretty obvious from what Martin and Bridget have said that the first thing has got to be a united um, effort against the current party and we've and and I suppose the the next thing is to get a decent political system and then we can start living normally again so I think those are the main lessons that we take and um so I think what I'm trying to say is bring this to an end because time's passed um thank you very much everybody and thank you particularly Bridget for um, joining in. I'm sorry about the trouble with the share screen. I think we had an interloper actually, because <laughs> there was something a bit odd going on, but it did at least sort itself out.